Hello, everyone. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Nikki Holland, director of the Canadian Club. Toronto and your host for today. Thank you for joining us online and welcome. Canadian Club Toronto, as our name suggests, proudly celebrates all things Canadian. Our events are designed to provoke thought, to critically engage, and to often entertain. Our long and successful track record demonstrates that we are resonating with you, our valued guests. At our podium, guest speakers tell their stories. They tell stories that matter, that influence, and that inspire. Today's panel, I hope and I am sure we'll do just that. First, let me give a few shout outs to some of our audience members. The Canadian Club of Toronto is supporting the participation of our youth and young leaders who are in attendance today. Humber College, Arts Administration and Cultural Management. <laughs> Queen's University, MA Arts Leadership. and York University Schulich School of Business MBA program in Arts, Media, Entertainment Management. It's really great to have you all with us today. And now it's time to introduce our panelists. Soul Pepper Theatre Company, the National Gallery of Canada, Toronto International Film Festival, three important artistic and cultural organizations with strong local, national, and global reputations. Their offerings have entertained many an audience. Their commonalities don't end here. All three institutions have new leaders who are working to propel their artistic mandate forward. All three are women. Uh, what are the challenges, the opportunities that lie ahead? Uh, let's hear from them now. Uh, Wayne Mangisha is the artistic director of Soul Pepper Theatre Company and an award-winning director known for her groundbreaking work and community engagement. She has been nominated for the Outstanding Director Dora five times and was recently named one of the 50 most influential people in Toronto by Toronto Life magazine. Sasha Suda has been the Director and CEO of the National Gallery of Canada for the past year, the youngest person to assume the role in more than 100 years. She is passionate about revitalizing the gallery's relevance. Her professional career began at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, where she worked in various roles for eight years and then returned to Toronto to work at the Art Gallery of Ontario. And Joanna Vincenti. Joanna is the executive director and co-head of the Toronto International Film Festival. She previously served as the executive director of the Independent Filmmakers Project. She is an Academy Award nominated producer of over 40 feature films by acclaimed directors. Joanna was named by Variety as one of the 60 most influential people in New York and was named to Variety's Women, Variety's Women Impact list twice. Her current, our current club president, of course, Bruce Celery, will moderate our discussion today. He's an author, podcaster, and columnist, and he appears regularly on CBC Radio, City Line, and Breakfast Television. I'm excited to hear from these powerful leaders, Bruce and the panelists. Have a great chat. Thank you very much, Nikki. Hello, everyone. How are you doing? Good. There is something amazing about being new, new to a gig. You, many of us have had that experience in jobs or in roles where we're new, it's exciting. It's that mix of excitement and terror, right? There's some terror there. It's the optimism that anything is possible and the pessimism that taking this job was a big mistake. It's a terrible, terrible idea. It is the joy of meeting new people and the uh, fear of forgetting all of their names, right? Because you're meeting new people all the time. So there are many extraordinary arts leaders in this country. And why we have chosen these three is because of the perspective that they bring being so new into their, into their roles, into their organizations. So we're going to talk about new perspectives and new priorities with our, with our panelists today. Wayne, I want to begin with you. Okay. You are returning to a company that you had history with. Yeah. You were in the first cohort of the Soul Pepper Academy. You directed there for many years. You left and came back. What did you notice about being new? New to this job, new to an artistic director job. What did you notice? Um, well, you know, we were obviously also going through a major transition. So there was lots that's been new at Soul Pepper. Um, 
I think that it's also my first time being artistic director. So it's, it's a completely new way of thinking about the institution, um, where before I was really thinking about an audience and that my relationship with that audience, and now, I was thinking about, now I'm thinking about the city and how we're engaging with the city and, of course, the country. So it's a totally new, new shift in, in, in the way that we're thinking and um, the way that we're looking at not just the content, but how we are making that content and how we're structuring um, the organization to empower all the artists that come through the organization, so. You made a big splash at your opening event, so I hear. I wasn't there, but I heard that you danced. I danced. I paint think, paint uh, the picture. This is not how it rolls yeah, for yeah, every no. artistic director. <laughs> you have to rethink it. In the country, it. Yeah. this yeah. is not the standard playbook. What, what happened? Well, you know, we wanted to make a gesture, Emma Senning and I, who is the executive director of Soul Pepper, um, to really do some kind of a radical gesture of welcome into the, or into the, into the institution. Um, and uh, we wanted to think about a creative way of doing that. So we had a community gathering that invited people across sectors and um, definitely to the theater community and, uh, and invited a bunch of artists and, and had a chance for people to have different access points into talking about what the new Soul Pepper will be like. A chance for the community to have an investment and to have a way to communicate that. So we actually filled one of our theaters with sort of post-it cards and provocative questions and asked them to answer them. We have hundreds of cards that we're still going through around sort of ideas and um, suggestions from the community. And then we had a large sort of engaged dance experience that one of our artists led the whole community through. And we had hundreds of people dancing together in unison. Um, and to kick it off, I thought I had to do something to really <laughs> get people inspired. And um, so I definitely, I took off my heels, I threw them into the crowd and jumped up by there and I, and I danced. And it was, you know, also, it's, it's also, it was also me bringing a piece of myself, because it was also a cultural African dance and um, got people, uh, invited people to sort of bring themselves to the community. And you know, we are, we're, we're really striving to be a community hub that's civically engaged and that's asking people to bring themselves to the organization in an authentic way. So I thought I would start with that. Sasha, I wanna ask you about what you noticed was new in your new job. And I'd like you to include in your answer this anecdote that I read in the Globe and Mail about your first day and arriving not through the staff entrance, but arriving as a patron would arrive and what changes that initial first impression led you to make. Well, so many of you have likely read this, but what you may not know is that the National Gallery is made up of two buildings and they're attached by a bridge. And that bridge really is meant to, by design, separate the public from the staff. And so when the building was built, and it's a magnificent monument to arts and culture, in 1988, and designed by Moshe Safdie, it was at a certain moment in, in museology when you might imagine that these two different groups may not want to intermingle. But of course, we've been thinking a lot differently about museums now in the same way that you were expressing this need to kind of bring the community in. I thought, well, I'd like to see what the community experiences when it walks through the halls of the National Gallery. And I'm, I'm almost six feet tall. And I walked by Mama, who is you know, the beautiful spider on our plaza, which welcomes about three million visitors a year, through the threshold. And it took me over 300 steps to see my first work of art. Um, and in fact, on my first day, I didn't make the detour into the galleries to see the work of art. I walked right to my office, which was an additional 400 steps, and I didn't see a single work of art. And I thought, that's quite stunning to me, this idea that we're an art museum and we're not declaring boldly who we are and how we can welcome our audience engaging our collection from the minute they cross our threshold. So we did tear out the ticket desk within the first few months that I was there. It felt very like a customs experience. Um, this large granite counter that separated the public from our amazing frontline team. And we invited uh, the artist Jorn Ango, a Sami artist from Norway, to come in. And he actually engaged the community in a building ex experience. Um, they, we were collecting a roadkill for many weeks. And literally? Literally. Literally roadkill. Literally, like we were was going... Was there a preference for raccoons over chipmunks? They, it was all there, including a skunk, who you can still find in the entrance now. Right. Um, it has off-gassed, as we say, uh, <laughs> euphemistically. 
And we engaged the community in skinning and tanning those hides and building a library to ind indigenous knowledge in that entrance. So it's totally transformed the experience and the whole, all of those public, public spaces leading up to the staff area now do have art. And you know, I, I encouraged the staff to use the public entrance. And of course, it wasn't until the art was in those spaces that everyone started to come out of the woodwork. And of course, it's because art leads the change, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's what I learned in my role was that you can lead with values, of course, but the art will incentivize change. How did you navigate that discussion internally? Did you just say, hey, town hall, we're stripping out the welcome desk? <laughs> well, it's, um, you know, I'll take you all behind the curtain. It's, you say at senior management meeting that you know this would be a great idea and people kind of nod nervously at you. And then the next week you say, no, no, we're really doing it. Who's gonna jump into this with me? And then they kind of nod nervously and somebody sort Is of she serious? raises their hand. And then two weeks later, you it's still not happening somehow miraculously. I was a first time CEO. I am a first time CEO, right? So so then I, I just wrote an all staff email and I said, well, we're, we're tearing out the ticket desk. So it's gonna, you know, my colleague Suzanne who manages my schedule came into my office and just looked yeah. at me like, really? That's, that's your approach. And then actually people jumped in and it was um, the staff who really took it on from, you know, not from the top, but from the middle. And once Yor got involved, it was, it was like a freight train left the station. There was no going back. So you didn't have to get a, out a sledgehammer yourself? Or a change management consultant, well. you know? <laughs> <laughs> Just invite an artist. Right, right. To lead that dialogue. Joanna, you are new to TIFF, you are new to Toronto. You're not new to being an executive director. You're not new to running a big facility. There's an extraordinary space in Dumbo that you uh, have been a part of for, for many years. What did you notice on arrival at Bell Lightbox? So I've been to TIFF many times. I used to be a producer, so I had many, many films at the festival, and it was always one of my favorite festivals in the world. It's a really unique place that combines the industry, the best audiences in the world, and the press that writes about your films. It's a great place to do business. I sold many films here, launched many films here, so I always looked at TIFF as this incredible organization. So, so I came in like 12, 13, uh, no, 14 months ago, and it was a big change of like coming from New York and moving into Toronto, uh, Canada, new country. Uh, last time I moved was from Portugal, and uh, it was like 25 plus years ago. Um, but yeah, it's been a- What kind of a New Yorker did you become? in the last 25 years. Are you the New York? I lived in New York for three years, only three years, and I noticed when I came back to Canada, I had become an elbower. Like I would just elbow people all the time because that's how you get around on the MTA. What kind of a New Yorker were you? I am a New Yorker before almost I'm Portuguese, like that's home for me. I am very direct, um, maybe too direct in Canada, it's very straightforward. Um, and, uh, and just believe in having very honest conversations about what we need to do, where we need to go, and I'm very good at getting a cab anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> right, I bet, it's like a superpower. One of the things you've talked about is in your newness, you could question everything. What are some of the questions that you raised, and how did you do that in a way that, um, acknowledge the extraordinary success that TIFF has had, and at the same time, you're new. You got questions. Why, why is the photocopier there? Exactly. So I think being a producer, because every project is different, you're always questioning what is the best approach. How do I go about financing it or packaging or who's the audience for this film? So the approach is always different. And I think I always kept that with me, that every situation is different and it needs um, questioning, so obviously I inherited an incredible organization that had been ran by Piers and Michelle, who's here. Um, but like, how can we bring the organization to the 21st century? How do we think of what is the festival of the future? The landscape, the industry is changing at a dramatic pace. The changes just alone last year in terms of like huge tech companies getting into the streaming business. 
Um, it's just like everything is being disrupted so quickly that we need to be taking into account everything that is happening and taking that input into what we do and making sure that we're adjusting and, and being ready for that. So really asking why do we do all of these things? Do we need to do all of these things? Are we doing these things the best way that we can do them? Uh, what our stakeholders are also changing, so just making sure that we keep uh, tabs on mm. how everything is changing. Sasha, I want to ask you, and, and, and then I'll open it up, what perspectives that you bring do you find to be most notable in this first year or two? And what I mean by that is all of us bring all sorts of things. We bring our gender, we bring our language, we bring our history, we bring our academic experience, we bring our work experience. If I were to ask this question to Warren Buffett, he might say the perspective that is most notable in how he runs his funds is the fact that he's a bridge player. He's a game player. He sees business as a game. And it would be wonderful if we all brought our full lived experience to everything. But I would, I, I would assert that there are elements of our perspective that we can notice as being more pronounced, especially in these first, you know, in these first months or years. What would you say has been one perspective that you thought, oh, this may be because I see the world through these glasses? So this might surprise you all, but I think it's because I'm a medievalist. And what does that even mean? Does that mean you're super into Game of Thrones? Uh, there's two kinds, and I'm not in that camp. But um, <laughs> So you're not going to kill me with a pickaxe? No, but I started my career in the Department of Medieval Art at the Met, and I have a PhD in medieval illuminated manuscripts from the 1400s. And I worked on exhibitions of really, really old stuff. And often people kind of wonder how that's relevant today. And I. You know, eight formative years of learning how to tell those stories in, an, in a really engaging way because surprise, surprise, history repeats itself. So mm -hmm. there's a perspective there on kind of how the past can connect to the present and maybe even help us kind of foresee how to avoid the same issues in the future. But most of all, you know, we never felt like the audience was going to come marching towards the medieval galleries. We had to tell great stories. We weren't entitled to anyone's attention. Right? Did we you were, tried just serving snacks? Uh, I think that would have been hard in a museum. Hard in a museum, right. but I did, I did at times, I was instructed to go move our stanchion in front of the Gauguin stanchion or the Van Gogh stanchion <laughs> while the, the info desk people went on break. But I mean, that kind of idea, <laughs> that's a true story. Uh, healthy competitiveness, you know, within the workplace. But truly this idea of telling a story that's relevant to people, not feeling like everyone is already, or should, even worse, should be interested in what you're doing. I think we're all, you know, arts is, visual art, art, culture, it's, it's a matter of life or death. It's how much we engage with it and convey that enthusiasm to the rest of the world that will determine the power that it can have within society. And so I, I think I learned that from being a medievalist. Wow and uh, not having a kind of uppity sense of you know, how interested people were in my stuff. Right. Joanna, what about for you? What of the many things that you bring to this role do you notice as being particularly discernible or relevant? I think I've always been trying to see where things go and where I see challenges, and then like, how do we go about fixing what we need to fix and what's the opportunity there? Uh, so with my production company, we were at the beginning of the digital uh, revolution. We had the first digital studio in the US. We experimented with new forms of distribution, with day and date, when I had a company with Mark Cuban. So, so I think it's, it's really looking at where things are going, looking at kind of everyone is fighting for, for people's attention. Everything that we do, it's about audiences. How do we engage audiences both in the building? How do we make those experiences in the building that is not, not just seeing a film, but it's a transformative mm. experience? Mm. And, and at the same time, where do we engage audiences where they are? Uh, so we partnered with Bell and, and, and Crave and, and started this new um, digital shelf with the TIFF original films that played at festival that wouldn't get distribution in Canada and now they have it 
an opportunity to reach audiences across Canada. So it's, it's, it's trying to always look at where can we go and what are things that need to be fixing. And like the futurist part of yes. your brain. Yeah. Wayne, what about for you? What perspective do you notice that is like, oh, this is new. Wayne walked in and this is kind of new. Um, definitely my community, um, social activism, I suppose, is what I would say. I mean, for me, the theater from a young age was a place that I felt was uh, an opportunity to, that, that's sort of democratic, not politically or religiously you know, connected to anything. It's a, it's a neutral space that can really hold conversation for a city. Um, and so I, since I've been there, we started a community conversations, which I think really it, it, it does the thing that sort of it asks us to really contextualize how the plays are relevant to our city, because we have these topics that we'll bring out that are sort of civically themed, that are across sectors, that invite people to come and talk about the shows. Um, also, we've done some radical welcoming of gesture, you know, to invite people into the theater with every show has a $25 ticket mark. Um, 25 and under audiences are free to come and see the show. Already we've, we just started that program in January. We have 1,700 new members. We've given away 380 tickets of young people who have come and um, just really empowering them to sort of have an ownership and a sense of belonging in this space. Um, yeah, and I, so I think, I think the, those are the things mm. that I'm going, right, this is how uh, I, I feel like theater uh, no matter, you know, history repeats itself, it doesn't matter when the play was written, it matters why mm -hmm. and how we make that uh, relevant to our audiences. And I think it is our job to translate that and to, to tell them that this is for you, this is your space, and this is how we can have a contemporary conversation about it and how we can be a meeting place for, um, for the city. At all of our community conversations, we invite experts and we invite people from across sectors to come and engage in that conversation. Mm -hmm. So. I want to talk about priorities, and Sasha, I'm going to ask you, you, you outlined a couple in advance of our conversation, but one that had particular resonance for me is this notion of cultural diplomacy. Can you talk a little bit about what that means in the context of National Gallery and why you were so passionate about it? Sure, so one of the things I've, I've, that's been an eye-opener for me moving to Ottawa from Toronto and prior to Toronto being in New York was um, you know, how much of a portal it is to the rest of the world number one, but how much the world is looking to Canada today. And I mean, I'm in the heart of a diplomatic community there, so I go to a lot of dinners and luncheons and um, cocktail parties talking to ambassadors from around the world. And they are really palpably and authentically excited about what's going on in this country. Uh, and it's all about our values, right? Imperfect as we may be, we're embracing democracy and uh, reconciliation and um, decency and cultural tolerance and we're welcoming people. I mean, these are all things that um, I find have brought attention to the gallery that might not have otherwise been there. And there's a desire for us to share our art and our artists with the world. And right now we're grappling with that in Ottawa. We're trying to figure out who's going to lead that initiative and, and we're talking about it a lot and we're, you know, what we think at the National Gallery is that by putting Canadian art on the world stage will help to rise the tide within Canada as well. And so that's kind of my enthusiasm about cultural diplomacy is that there's a real opportunity for reciprocity globally in, in that cultural exchange. Uh, one other big dynamic that's already been seeded, Wayne, is this question about how people use their time and our fight for their time. How does a multi-platform approach work at Soul Pepper? And uh, as you ponder that question, I will say, for those of you who don't know, Wayney was the director of the Soul Pepper production of Kim's Convenience, which was a massive hit, went across the country, and has become this global phenomenon on television thanks to its uh, distribution. So how do you think about multi-platform, given that I'm sure your board wants to see certain bums in seats in those two theaters, or three theaters, or four theaters that you have? Yeah, I think we have to think, I mean, this is in inevitable, it's going to continue, there are going to be more and more uh, competition with streaming device, you know, shows and everything else, so 
I think it's about creating those relationships from the get-go and when we're commissioning work, thinking about how we can commission it to work on different platforms. You know, it's, I mean, we're not the only ones. Kim's Convenience is a, is a great success story. Also, Fleabag, which was a play, is now a multi-Emmy award-winning television series. It's happening in school. It's, it's going to continue to happen. And I think already Hollywood's understood that going to, you know, they're sort of plucking playwrights right out of Juilliard and different the playwriting schools. We can be an incubator. Um, for, um, for, for content, for multi-platforms. So I think it's um, embracing that and, uh, and making sure that we're, we're considering that while we're commissioning and while we're developing new work. Yeah. Joanna, I want to ask you about TIFF's role from an advocacy perspective. And it wouldn't have been a question that I would have really thought about prior to your arrival, but when I looked at your bio and the work that you have done in New York, that was a real push of, uh, of what you did. What is TIFF's role? What should TIFF's role be? Well, I think we, because of the platform of the festival, we have this incredible opportunity to really highlight international film in a way that no one else can do it in North America. And it was amazing to see uh, on Sunday the Oscar go to Parasite. And you were there. And I was there with and, the, and our board chair, Jen. And who Pritchard. did you wear? <laughs> A Canadian designer, I hope. No, not a Canadian oh designer. We'll just move right off that. You just had something from the closet. You didn't have time to pick a new gown. Who has time? Someone Please. lend me a Someone gown. Someone lent you so. a gown. Fine. <laughs> Next year, we'll set you up. So but, advocacy. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but I think there's really, I feel like Canada is just the perfect bridge between the world and North America. And, it's, uh, and, and also between all of the English-speaking countries and North America, so I think it can play a really important role in highlighting the best storytellers, um, international storytellers, and then bring them into the US system. And since with the power of the studios, they do have the power to then bring those people uh, internationally, yeah. Sasha, how do you think about an Instagram strategy for the National Gallery. And what I'm linking it to is this kind of multi-platform competition for time. Is there a selfie station in front of Voice of Fire? <laughs> Will we be able to climb up into Maman the Spider and like take photos from up there? How do you think about integrating that experience? Are you gonna follow up this conversation with your CV? Or... <laughs> <laughs> do you think maybe that's my future? I could do that? No, I'm terrible, I'm not even on Instagram. Uh, of course, we're, we'd love to engage with people in all kinds of ways. And in fact, we're on Instagram. And if you go through, which I do often because I find it extremely uplifting, through the geo tags of the organization, it is a profoundly different audience that's Instagramming itself than we associate with the National Gallery of Canada. So uh, I think that the social media platforms, as challenging as they can be to engage um, and, and manage and moderate, they can provide great hope and optimism as well. Joanna, what would you say about how the filmmakers, how the film community thinks about Netflix? It is the OxyContin. Uh, what's shocking to me is to see Netflix participate in the industry like an old time movie studio, except for they've got, you know, the run of the theater is for five minutes and then everybody else is watching Marriage Story at home with Uber Eats and texting their mom because, you know, they're not in the theater seeing it with a thousand other people. How do you think about it? So it, it's complicated. Uh, so was Marriage Story. So that was, was Marriage Story. Film. So, you know, Netflix has, is investing, you know, $15 billion a year in content. So imagine that. That's incredible opportunities for filmmakers, for storytellers to tell their stories. They're giving them a certain amount of freedom to tell those stories without the controls that sometimes would be associated with those productions if they were uh, financed by a studio. Uh, they're really working with the best filmmakers out there from Alfonso Cuaron to uh, David Fincher, Dee Rees, Jane Campion. And, and it's also they're expanding what a story is or what a film is. It doesn't need to necessarily be an hour and a half. It could be three and a half hours like The Irishman, or it could be a 13-hour series that people can decide to binge and see it all at once or decide to see it in episodes. The, the, you know, the, on the flip side, I think, and I think we'll see a lot of competition. So the good news, it's good for filmmakers all around, of course, 
there's a danger that local filmmakers might get a bit squashed by the global ones. But on the flip side, we, there's so much content, there's so much noise that we all kind of rely on what is recommended for me. And that's the scary part because it becomes then very monolithic and you just see the same thing all movies. the time as opposed to really getting out of your comfort zone because that's where transformation happens is when you stumble upon things that maybe you were not expected to see. Um, so there's like this wonderful mm -hmm. thing, but at the same time, some dangers. And then, yes, we've been at the TPL Lightbox, we've been um, benefiting from um, all of these wars and we've been able to show some of those Netflix films that really deserve to be shown in theaters like Marriage Story or Two Popes, The Irishman. Uh, but at the same time, it's five minutes and then they, they're at home. And, and I think that experience in theaters where you're completely immersed in a dark room with a community of people is, is an experience that you can't. Unlike any other. Unlike yeah. any other, yes. uh, I'm gonna include some questions from the floor and Sasha, I'll point this one to you. We heard a little bit from Wayne and please chime in more. Can you expand more on the importance of community or how you see your organization as a community hub? Sure, so this project that you're uh, brought to the gallery uh, in building the Sami library uh, involved indigenous communities from around Ottawa but throughout Canada in the skinning and the tanning. Uh, and then when we opened the show, which was sort of the debut of this piece and the show that's currently up, Abadakwane, which means continuous fire in Algonquin, that's what this little pin is, closes in September, so you have lots of time to come. That opening, we actually invited the Algonquin community to structure for us because we were inviting, at the last minute we decided to invite all the artists and there's 70 artists in that show. And uh, this is kudos to, to Canada that it's even possible. 60 of those artists made it within a four month planning window to the opening uh, from all over the world, whether it be Taiwan, Australia, New Zealand, Norway, Finland. Um, it was quite extraordinary. And we just, we handed over control, right? And that's something that we're not so good at in large institutions, is giving up control and space for other communities to do things their way. And remarkably, and probably not so surprisingly, it was the largest opening we've ever had in our history. Wow. And we had no marketing dollars for that show. We did a kind of guerrilla marketing campaign. We wheat, paste, we wheat pasted all the walls outside of the gallery, which there was, we were really worried about, but which worked out well. Especially and after you took away the visitor center. <laughs> <laughs> What's next? Yeah, so then, and then all that activity that Yor was doing outside the building got a lot of conversation going. In the press, we had unprecedented earned media and 3,000 people came to that opening. So I think it's, um, it, when you want to engage the community, it's gotta be a really authentic and real thing and it, it means you, you probably have to feel a bit uncomfortable and not know what might happen. And it was an unbelievably soulful, remarkable event which you know we can't reverse engineer even though we're trying desperately to. Wayne, I'm gonna ask this question to you. I'm gonna ask you the colloquial version and then I'll read out the question. So the colloquial version is, what is the role of government? So you can answer that question, but the question as written is, do you see a need for a new Massey Commission that considers the priorities of today's society? The reason I'm giving you the colloquial version is I don't know what the Massey Commission is. So I don't expect you to either. Uh, so what is the role of government? What is the role of big policy and big think? To ensure that artists have the freedom to speak from their heart and to be able to not be censored and to not only be uh, answering to a specific margin of people. I think that's, that, that it's to ensure that we have, um, that we can be progressive in our thought, that we can encourage artists to continue to be provocative. Um, that, that is the role, I think, that we can truly figure out what it means to have a Canadian voice because we are asking people to be unabashedly themselves without fear. You all have a great degree of experience career-wise, but given the newness, there are things for you to learn. Joanna, I'm gonna ask you first, what is the one thing you're like, aside from how to ride the TTC or whatever, what is the one thing that you would say is on the top of your list that you want to learn in the next 12 to 18 months to forward the success of your role at TIFF? 
Everything Canadian. Everything Canadian. <laughs> right, I how to really, be so polite, how to make poutine at home. No, I really, really want, I, 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 I know about Canadian cinema, I, but I need to go a lot deeper so that we can do a better job and that I can help champion mm. uh, the support of Canadian filmmakers and what they need. Yeah. Sasha, what do you want to learn? I just want to learn how to most quickly empower our team to do what they do best and to make them live and be themselves without fear. And that will give us access to the greatest ideas. So that's what I need to learn. Wayne, what about for you? What is one thing you'd love to learn? Um, hmm. I think, you know, what, what's, what's the newest to me in this role, of course, is, is fundraising and the nonprofit model and trying to really um, connect my, uh, develop the relationships with the philanthropic community and um, to make sure that, yeah, that we are continuing to create relationships between that community and the artists and, and generating um, an authentic conversation so that, um, that, that, that the support can be something that we can all rely on, thrive. There are many people in this room who are mid-career, but there are also people who are just getting started, and it's why we love to have the youth and the young leaders here, because in the arts especially, we need to be thinking about that next generation. Wayne, give us like the brief snapshot of how Soul Pepper is really investing in that next generation, not just of um, you know, arts leaders, but of all, everyone in the ecosystem of what it takes to get a play on stage. I mean, this is the thing I'm most proud of of Soul Pepper. I, I believe that we are a big part of the um, an, an engine for the theatrical um, artists across the country. You know, with, I, I am a result. Um, I'm here because I was part of the Soul Pepper Academy, which was a two-year paid training program. Um, a lot of us, when I started, before I left 10 years ago, I think women of color represented 6% of directors across the country who were hired. So we were definitely not in a lot of management positions. So there was a, uh, you know, a jump that had to happen. And I think Soul Pepper Academy, the training, the two years that I had to really experiment and push um, what was really key. And that's something that we're, we're looking to um, continue. And of course, we, we have a really robust education program. And we're also mentoring. And we have resident companies that we're mentoring. So I think that is how we're going to ensure that there are arts leaders with, um, that represent many different voices in years to come. Sasha, you next, and then Joanna. What needs to be done in the world of art to find, cultivate, energize that next generation? I think it's just to make as many invitations to new people to be part of the conversation and keep inviting them in even when it's hard, and even when it's slower, and even when it's more inefficient, and even when it contradicts you what you're thinking or where you think you want to go. You just got, we got to keep doing it. Joanna? We have a big focus on trying to help move the needle on gender issues, bringing, really giving more opportunities, making sure that women are moving as fast as men, as, that they have the same opportunities, that they have mentorship, and that they have access to financing and they get their films done the same way. You look at film school, you have 50% of the students are men, uh, male and female. By the time they submit a first film at one of the major film festivals, 30% are female. So what is happening there? Mm. And then you have a woman who makes her first film. It takes her five to seven years to make her second film, as opposed to a man on average in a year and a half. So we're really focusing on moving the needle on that and trying to accelerate that process. I'm gonna wrap up with one last question uh, directed at each of you. I'll begin with you, Joanna, and it is this. What is your one wish? What is your one request or wish or hope uh, for this room and for the world at large? In fact, I believe that if you make this wish, the universe will provide, the universe will listen. So make it big, don't hold back. What is your one wish that would forward the mandate, in your case of TIFF, beyond anything you have ever imagined? That. Uh, Tiff Bell Lightbox, the building, becomes as relevant, exciting, and known as a festival. Beautiful. Okay, we're just going to take that in. Got it. Good. Sasha, one wish. For me, it's that for every Canadian, art is a kind of must-have in their, in their life and not a nice-to-have. I think if art is a must-have for every Canadian in some small facet or large facet of their life, that we'd all be walking on a cloud. Hmm. Wayne. Yeah. 
Um, I absolutely agree with that, and I think that for that to continue and to be, and, and to ensure that that happens, we are funding for our training and education programs at Soul Pepper. Amazing, uh, yeah. amazing, amazing. Uh, we're gonna wrap our conversation here. A big round of applause for Wayne Sasha and Grant. Awesome, awesome. Nikki, back to you. Wow. Okay. So, Wayne, Sasha, and Joanna, thank you all so much. Uh, on behalf of the Canadian Club, we want to thank you for inspiring us uh, with your artistic brilliance, your visionary ideas. I'm, I'm looking at Sasha. Uh, we met two years ago, almost, and I'm amazed by her and, and the rest of you, but I'm just so proud of you right now. Um, isn't that nice? Uh, <laughs> As you all three of you suggested, we cannot afford to dilute our artistic institutions. They are an, a really important part of our identity and help us to unify in times of division and in strife. We are really encouraged by your exciting plans for the theater, for the gallery, and for film. And audiences should feel comforted and inspired that the three of you are the most recognized art, are running our most recognized arts institutions in the land and we have such, under such terrific leadership. We wish each of you record-breaking successes. Audiences and strong support for the important work that you do on behalf of Canadians and Canadian culture and arts. And of course, Bruce, thank you for leading the conversation. Before we conclude, I wanna also thank mediaevents.ca, Canada's online event space, and VVC for live streaming today's events. And thank you all for joining us today. Have a great day.